uh, okay. So my research is in privacy, mostly privacy uh, of consumers of different technologies, trying to understand what risk different technologies pose to people when they use it and then come up with um, scalable and usable. So that's the keyword, like usable solution so that people actually can use these privacy enhancing technologies in their daily lives of using other technologies. So let me start with a definition of privacy. Like what do we mean by privacy? What is privacy? And there are, uh, so there are many historical definitions and there are many definitions focusing on the modern technological space. Uh, but uh, the uh, first definition that I'll, I'm gonna talk about is this metaphorical definition of privacy as a boundary management scheme. So that means that we have our private space and there is a boundary surrounding us and we can choose how much we want to reveal or how, how, how many people or when, which people we want to let them come inside this boundary. Another definition says that privacy is the ability to control our information, what data we want to reveal to other people. And this applies to or extends to group definitions as well. Like we are, we are a group and we want, we have some collective privacy information and we want the ability or to control whether we want to collectively con um, uh, decide whether we want to reveal some information to other people or not, or other groups or not. The third definition is doesn't focus on the data itself, rather the context in which data is generated. So according to that definition, it's the contextual privacy as a contextual integrity. So it says that data itself is not private or sensitive, but uh, a privacy violation occurs when the context in which the data was generated and then the data in the context in which the data was used they don't comply with each other or they violate our norms or expectations. So let me give you an example. If I go to a doctor and I fill up questionnaire about my health information, health history, it doesn't matter how sensitive those data are. Uh, and I'm okay as long as the data that I gave them is used in the same context in the, for the purpose of, uh, of uh, health diagnostics, for example, and not for selling me drugs or advertising. So uh, the context in which data is generated, it includes the data itself, the resender, the receiver, the purpose of uh, data generation and the transmission principle, like how the data is transmitted from sender to the receiver. So as long as this context remains same, it's okay. Anyway, so, so there are these, uh, all these definitions of privacy and still we are not sure how to capture all these use cases, but at least the scholars agree that privacy is important. Why? Because privacy allows us to be free. So consider like when we are not under surveillance when no one is watching us or listening us that's the time when our when we are in our true self and but as a social species we mix with other people we are social being and um, we modify our behavior in different social contexts right so social uh, being in touch with other people also influences our thought process, how we present ourselves, how we behave in order to fulfill some social criteria or so other people's expectations. So uh, that's okay as long as the other people who also has our best interest in their mind. So for example, our friends, our family members, our parents, so they know us and the amount of information other people know about us, the more power they have, but it's okay for 
for people who are close to us because they have our best interest in their mind. But that's not the same for some algorithms who learns about us over time. So, uh, and these private moments, they are very important to have creative thoughts. But when we are surrounded, constantly surrounded by all the surveillance technologies, it creates this chilling effect that we are no longer in our true self. We cannot uh, think freely. So, which is why in European countries, privacy has been recognized as a fundamental human right. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case in the US, but uh, uh, there are some um, uh, states that are coming up with, uh, with uh, new regulations, like uh, the CCP in California, that recognizes privacy as a human right or should be protected by default by technologies. So, and I should also mention that privacy is not equivalent or equal to secrecy. So it's not only about uh, trying to keep uh, data, some data secret. So one example is like, uh, uh, if you, when you are sitting for an exam and you are writing, but you see the, probably the examiner is looking at you. Right, it's not, so maybe the same person will also grade your paper. So it's nothing is secret to them, but still in the moment, you don't feel comfortable. And often what I have found that I, I keep writing, even though I don't have anything to write or I pretend to write to fulfill that person's expectation that I should be writing instead of thinking what I should be writing. And then the, Second uh, most important factor of privacy is that it helps us to evade manipulation. So again, the more knowledge others have about us, the more power they have over us. So think about the Cambridge Analytica scandal. What happened was um, some people were able to get information uh, of Facebook users and their friends, and then they created these massive data sets of behavioral traits, and then they tried to manipulate these people to advertisement and other uh, other ways to to influence their voting preferences or political views, and it was possible because they could learn about certain behavioral traits or psychological uh, psychological traits of these people. So. When we uh, use Google, uh, uh, map applications, for example, if we reveal our homes, our office, and our other places where we frequently recite. When we share photos, we reveal where we went for a vacation. Our uh, wearable devices that we use, like smartwatch or eye tracker, they can learn much more intimate details about us. For example, when we are excited, when we are emotional, feel angry, when we, how many times we wake up at night. And these are very intimate details and can be, so can be used for malicious purposes. Uh, when, what can we do? Like it's not that we can just get rid of this technology because they also have good purposes, uh, good use cases. So what, what can we do? So here is my research. So I try to understand these problems from humans perspectives and also uh, coming up with some solutions that are usable and practical and can be deployed at scale. So Mostly I talk, I uh, work um, in two domains, two different domains. One is on social media, uh, privacy, visual data privacy, and uh, education technology. So I'll first start with the social media privacy. So what's going on there? So we share images, right? And according to one estimate, we share more than almost 2 billion images every day on different social media platforms. And what happens is since a large portion of these images end up in public domains and can be accessible by anyone, can be scraped from the websites, they are being used to, to create um, machine learning based tools and technologies to identify people, recognize people online, to track them online. 
for visual surveillance, advertising. So one particular case that came up uh, very, not very recently now, it has been two years, but so there is a tech startup for uh, Clearview AI. What it did was um, it scraped millions of websites and collected, I think 15 million images of people. And then it trained a model and provided this model as a service. So anyone can use this model or their service to track anyone else online. And um, for surveillance, for advertising, for whatever purpose. And it was so aggressive that other advertising companies like Google and Facebook also like uh, came up and um, told them to stop, or at least they prevented this Clearview AI to scrap from uh, Facebook and Google sites to collect further images. But that was not the end of the story. This Clearview AI data set, when there were, uh, there were 3 billion photos, it was hacked. And so see, these 3 billion images are now public. I don't know, maybe it, it could be in the dark web and um, can be used for any purpose by anyone. So now it's, uh, it's not only the case that people who use different technologies like social media website and or upload their images, they are at risk, but also people who exercise self-censorship in sharing data, disclosing data about themselves. Even people who do not have any social media account, they are also at risk because photos are a very rich source of data set. And when you take photos, you, uh, especially if it's in, in semi-public or public spaces, we capture a lot of other people who didn't give us consent to take their photo or upload this on social media. So um, privacy is very interdependent. We can violate other people's privacy and same, the same can happen to us as well. Um, and recently there has been also this uh, um, incidents of meme sharing. So we we create memes, we share memes. Uh, it's, it has been uh, it has become a major source of entertainment online. But there have been also severe incidences, like people uh, suffer uh, consequences in their professional life or personal life or social life because their memes went viral on social media. So. This is the research question that I want, I focused during the PhD. Like how can we protect our privacy when other people are control, how, our, uh, how other people are in control uh, of sharing our information. Like uh, when we share a meme or when we share images that capture other people, they don't have any control over their data, which is a severe violation of privacy. So what can we do? So the first thing, um, first solution we came up was like trying to identify people who should be an, uh, in, in an image and who shouldn't be. So in other words, we tried to classify people either as subject or as bystander in an image. And uh, once we do that, we can easily just uh, maybe remove the bystanders or obfuscate them using image filters and so on. So that's what we wanted to do. But the problem was that this classification is very subjective and context dependent. So for example, uh, in this image, there are three people, they have very different visual appearance. But um, we probably, we would classify all of them as subject because they are, um, they are performing some action as a team. So that means that in classifying them, we are using our background knowledge, our uh, memory, and our uh, other knowledge from other contexts, and applying, making inference based on all those background knowledge. Here is a different, uh, the opposite scenario. So in this image, people look very uh, similar to each other. But when we asked uh, like study participants to classify them, they came up with different levels for these people. So again, uh, they use their background knowledge, their memory and so forth, but 
to do this classification automatically automatically we don't have these sorts of rich inferential knowledge so how can we do this here is our approach uh, we first try to understand how humans conceptualize subject and bystanders and then identify some high level features like uh, why or based on what factors they make these decisions and then map these high level features into low level image features and then we build a classifier Hello? Yes, I think I'm back. Yes, can you hear me? Okay, all right, good. Um, sorry for the interruption. So, so yeah. So we have this high level concept and then we can ask many low level details and then try to map these details into this high level concept space. This is what we did here. So we, sh we showed images to people like uh, you saw earlier and then asked to, for each person, classify them either as a subject or a, or a bystander. And then we asked them why why uh, they label someone as a subject or bystander. And they gave us many reasons, including like this person looks comfortable uh, being in this photo, or they were intentionally captured by the photographer, or if we remove them, it will completely change the meaning of the photo. So these reason, reasonings are still at a very high level. Like how can we, from an image, a machine can understand if some person someone is uh, comfortable or not, or whether the photographer intentionally captured them or not. It's still very um, uh, high level information. So we went one step lower and then we used many uh, machine learning, deep learning based uh, models that gave us information, raw information about the image or uh, people in the image. So for example, we use one model to, to uh, to identify their body pose. And then from these uh, body pose, we collected data about their body joints and uh, angles between different links. And then from this, we kind of inferred like what is the overall orientation of this body. We used another model to detect faces and then we fed these faces into a third model that could come up with scores um, across different uh, emotional states like angry or happy or surprised and so on. So we 
had many other such models. We used them, we applied them on images, and then we built a lower level feature set about people in that images. And then we found, um, we computed statistical dependencies, or we mapped these low level feature sets to that, uh, to uh, immediate or uh, at a higher features at a higher level, like polls or comfort or intention. And then in the second step, we again map these intermediate level features to the classification question, like whether based on these features, now tell, tell me if this person is a subject or a bystander. And so here is a result. So we also you uh, experimented with many other different models, different model arch architectures, different feature set. But you can see that the last row shows this two-step process, and it has uh, much more higher accuracy compared to these all these other models, including many like large deep learning models like ResNet. So, and. Here you can see several examples. Uh, so the red boxes shows someone was classified as a uh, as a bystander. Green boxes shows that person was classified as a subject with this model. And all of these classifications are correct. Here you can see some wrong classifications. So again, green means subject, uh, red means bystander. But uh, now this classification the are not uh, correct. Okay, so we have some model to classify people and there are al also other uh, computer vision based work that can detect other kind of sensitive objects like computer screen or text and so on. And once we detect these models, uh, sorry, uh, these objects, then the next step is how can we obfuscate them or how can we hide them or remove them from the image? So there are many methods like encryption. You can just encrypt part of the images and then only people who have these decryption keys, they can recover the full image. But these kind of approaches are not very usable in practice, or at least not in the, in the context of social media, because here it, the goal is not to only allow some people or distribute keys to some people, this is very cumbersome, so that they can recover the full image, rather is to share as widely as possible in some cases. So um, these solutions are not usable in practice. So we propose some other solutions based on obfuscations, like how can you, you filter out some of the, some, of, some portion of these images, but still retain their visual aesthetics. So, we studied a bunch of filters, uh, but unfortunately, most of them actually didn't um, work very well in terms of both uh, properly hiding this information and retaining the visual aesthetics of these images. So in the next, here you can see uh, two examples, like just blackening out versus uh, using pixelation. So uh, again, they didn't work very well. So we came up with, uh, we tried to enhance the visual aesthetics of the images with transfer learning. So you, you probably, if you use uh, Instagram or Facebook, you have seen this, like you have a picture and you have a painting, you can transfer the style of this painting to this image. So for example, the top left is the original picture. Um, and then it's a city in Germany, I think, Tubingen. And then you can see the small box in small box with different uh, famous painting, historically very uh, important and famous painting. And then this picture was trans or was modified to feed the style of this painting. So this is what we did um, in another study. And you can see here some example, like uh, the rightmost person uh, was obfuscated, but then also the whole image went through these visual uh, alterations to uh, to change the style uh, uh, according to different paintings, famous paintings. Okay, so we have so we now have some ways to detect sensitive content in images. We now have some ways to uh, remove or obfuscate this content but they don't really help in this case of meme sharing or privacy uh, privacy through uh, memes. Because the problem here is 
uh, not the content, but rather how or why this content is being shared. Um, and this is a very much social issue, not very technical. So uh, the, the, the the problem is with people's behavior. And so we tried to apply a behavioral intervention approach in this case. So this was a very close co collaboration with psychologists and cognitive scientists. And we came up with uh, different priming methods to kind of discourage them to share these memes. By them, I mean people. Um, so I think you are you have seen this kind of um, visual priming. So when you see the left uh, the warning sign, uh, you you can see it in in emails, for example, when the email client thinks something is a phishing email or it has a uh, malicious content, so it warns you with this kind of signs. And the the, uh, the right uh, lock sign it means it's safe. Like when you visit an is uh, a website with HTTPS protocol. So that means this sign means, okay, this website encrypts data, so it's safe to use. Or it, uh, if the lock was read, then it would mean that this site is not very uh, safe. So don't enter your financial information, for example. So we have, we are used to seeing this kind of visual priming that makes us um, think before we take some time to think before we do something. So this concept came from actually psychology and they call it nudging or priming and uh, they have both good and bad, like uh, they can be used for both good and bad purposes. For good purposes, they have been used to nudge people to eat healthier, for example, or consuming, like improving people's uh, consuming behaviors. And recently after COVID uh, came, it was used to uh, motivate people to get vaccinated. So we try to prime people to respect others' privacy with uh, textual priming. We didn't uh, yet use any visual priming. So in one experiment, we asked different uh, the participants, we showed them uh, memes that you uh, saw earlier, not this kind of memes, but anyways, memes and then uh, ask them how likely are they to share these memes on um, their social media accounts. And they told us this much. So this is the control condition. We just simply asked them, how likely are you to share this image? And they said, okay, here. In a second condition, we prime, tried to prime them uh, by asking, taking into account the privacy of this person in this image, now tell us how likely are you to share this image on social media. And the idea was that if we directly uh, warn them about possible privacy violations, the uh, the um, sharing likelihood would go down. But in reality, it went up. So it was a very paradoxical findings for us. So when we warn people about possible pr privacy violations, they wanted to share more. And this was a very robust finding because we replicated this study three times uh, before we published this paper. And every time we got the same result. And um, so the, then the next question is then like, uh, why this is happening? What other factors are affecting people's um, photo sharing decisions in this context? So, there have been many studies understanding people's um, from psychological perspective, like understanding their psychological traits. So we looked at a specific trait called humor style. So humor style means that um, how people use humor to either entertain themselves or to uh, uh, to advance social connections by entertaining other people. And Human style has been found correlated with uh, narcissistic behavior, with empathy, and with aggressive behaviors like uh, online trolling. So it, it, it seemed to be very relevant to our purpose of studying meme sharing behaviors, uh, memes that may potentially violate other people's privacy. So um, humor style, it can vary along two dimensions. One is humor can be positive or negative. By positive, I mean it's harmless. Negative means it's uh, the humor is um, 
only sending to some other person and it can also vary along the line of like what is the purpose of using humor it could be again self entertainment or it could be building social connections so there are then four types of humor styles and so what we did was we collected data uh, about people's humor style and then we tried to understand like do people with different humor types differ in uh, photo sharing habits and then do people with different humor types react differently when we prime them with uh, our interventions on nudges? So what we did was we collected data, then we clustered people according to their humor style. So you can see here a two-dimensional projection of the three clusters. The first cluster, uh, we call it humor endorsers. That means people in this cluster they use humor a lot uh, and for all kinds of humor and for all purposes. Humor deniers, they don't use any kind of humor for any purpose. Self enhancers, they only use positive humors. Um, so we have these three clusters and we looked at, so here is only one result. So we, when we asked people, like, have you shared, have you ever shared any photo that might have uh, violated any stranger's privacy? And you can see that the humor endorsers, the people, uh, this group, um, they share hum all kinds of humor and for all types of purposes. So they told us yes, um, much more frequently than uh, they told us no, or also compared to all the, uh, the other two groups. And also when we looked at what happened when we primed them with our intervention, you see that we again have this paradoxical finding, but only for one group, humor deniers. So people who do not use humor uh, as frequently as a, an average person. But paradoxically, when we primed them about um, potential privacy violation, they wanted to share more now. So um, that means that people, we, we should customize these interventions uh, according, to, uh, according to different personality traits. And so this is an active area of research, like how can we understand people's personality traits and how can we modify our interventions, whether visual, textual, or, what, uh, or audio, priming, feed, uh, or to make it targeted and more effective in practice. Okay, so um, so this uh, research uh, was about how people's internal uh, factor, like their personality trait, affect their their data sharing behavior. We also looked at how external factors affect data sharing behavior. So one specific ex external factor was um, when suddenly someone goes viral on social media. What happens then? How? their engagement with that platform changed or how their share, sharing behavior changed. So we looked at uh, Twitter and we collected data of 20,000 um, scholars, like researchers and scientists for three years. And within this timeline, some of these scholars went viral for the first time after they created their Twitter profile. And uh, others didn't. So we have these two, two sets of people now, so viral users, non-viral users. And what we did was we mapped these people in a, in a high dimensional space based on their profile characteristics, based on their tweeting history and so on. And then we identified pairs from uh, these groups and uh, who, who are similar in terms of their behaviors and profile characteristics. So uh, in each pair, there was one person from the viral group, one person from the non-viral group. And the idea was that we have these two groups and they behave the same until the viral group went viral and then they changed their behavior. So, but the non-viral group didn't change behavior. So that means the change in behavior happened because of the viral events. So that was the purpose of this matching. And um, this is one form of causal inference analysis, like uh, identifying the cause of some effect. So the viral events were identified as reasons for them to sharing, to change their behaviors. And we have some, so when 
we compared the, the subsequent behaviors in these two groups, we found some interesting results. Like right after the viral event, you can see the zero point is when the viral event happened. And uh, then 15 means 15 days before the viral event. Positive 15 means 15 days after the viral event. So it, this, this plot shows like how their tweeting frequency changed over time before and after the viral event. And you can see that right after the viral event, the zero point, there was a sharp increase in tweeting. So which is expected, okay. We also found that subsequent tweets from the viral group were more factual, like more objective uh, and less subjective, like more uh, information uh, rather than more emotion. And then we also found the viral group had more positive sentiment in their tweets after they went viral. We also found that the viral group had more similarity, like they posted tweets that are more similar to the tweet that went viral. So which is also probably uh, pretty reasonable because people when, when they go viral, maybe they also want more viral events. Uh, uh, to gain more familiarity or gain more social capital. Okay, so that's past research. And in future, I also, I want to continue this, uh, this uh, line of research on visual data privacy, uh, but I want to get, I want to expand in terms of like, how can we conduct experiments? So the next plan is to build mobile applications that implements all these uh, computer vision-based uh, algorithms to detect and modify image content. And the reason we want to do it on mobile applications so that we can collect real data, like in, um, um, uh, how much actually this, uh, these uh, algorithms are effective in, uh, in, in real settings and how much uh, privacy value we can prevent uh, like measuring the effectiveness of these algorithms, these uh, interventions in real setting. I also want to extend this research on other, other contexts like um, a smart home surveillance system. So a smart home system, they have these cameras and these cameras are continuously recording images and videos of both the owners of this technology Hello? Hello? Okay, I think something is, I don't know. I, I think it has some kind of sensor. Uh, if I put it down, it goes off. Maybe, I, I, because I never used it without putting it on my head. Uh, but if someone asks questions, they, if there is, yeah, I can take it down. Um, so yeah, so there are assistive technologies for, for example, uh, people with visual impairment to help them um, um, shopping, for example, they can take images and there are applications, they can send these images to people to uh, with different questions, like what I'm looking at right now, is this uh, the thing I wanted to buy or help them nav navigate. Um, so again, there are privacy issues for these people because uh, they don't know what picture they're, uh, what, this, what is the content of these images before sending them to other people. And also there are privacy issues of surrounding people because when they, they wear these devices like um, AR, VR stuff, these uh, technologies also collect data about um, the surrounding people. So how can we mitigate these privacy issues? So if you are interested in mobile app development or um, IoT devices, uh, let me know uh, and interested in doing research in this area, uh, shoot me an email. Okay, so now let's move into the second uh, research domain that I, I am looking at. So this is about educational technology. And by educational technology, I mean, uh, whatever technology are being used for educational purposes, like you use Canvas, Discord, um, I think maybe also Piazza, Zoom, 
and uh, there are also remote proctoring applications. I don't know if they're being used here or not. And there are also mobile-based applications that track uh, school children um, to uh, track their behaviors and um, collect data about them to see if uh, there is something to worry about. And so on. anyways, so the, th the the edtech market is uh, experiencing a rapid growth due to this pandemic. So it is becoming, they are becoming ubiquitous. And you can see the, in this chart, the global edtech market is expected to be uh, more than $400 billion in 2025, uh, which is much more than the IoT market, or even I think maybe the also mobile phone market. Anyways, so unfortunately, with this rapid growth, we are also seeing this kind of headlines in newspaper more and more like, like massive data breaches in, um, in K-12 schools or even higher uh, educational institutes. And then hacking or uh, malwares. And uh, the other pro issue is intentional abuse of the data that these technologies collect for advertising purpose. For example, Google faced lawsuit about uh, um, scanning students' uh, emails and um, Proctorio also faced a lawsuit. I think it was maybe in Canada. So uh, these data breaches and all uh, or um, this intentional abuse of data both have this common root cause, like the collection of massive amount of data. So this is what we want to prevent. The problem is that um, uh, this data collection is often justified by uh, the, the need of learning analytics. So learning analytics means that measuring, collecting, and analyzing data about students in the context in order to improve their, their uh, learning method. <clears throat> so, uh, but we want to understand if we actually need all this data to build learning uh, analytic models. So to give you some example, uh, what kind of data this, uh, uh, these technologies are collecting and uh, how these data are being used to build learning analytic models. So they collect demographic information, age, gender, blah, blah, blah. And then they collect historical data like past grades or uh, past in, um, uh, name of past institutions and so on. They collect socioeconomic status like parents' income or household zip code. They collect behavioral data like how students interact with different um, learning um, educational technologies, like how uh, the, like Canvas records each and every mouse click or mouse drag. Mobility data, uh, for example, uh, from campus Wi-Fi or from uh, GPS, this education, this technology, mobile-based technology also collect how people move around, and then audio-video data uh, from remote proctoring or uh, remote class uh, technologies, and these data are being used to model students' course performance. For example, the uh, the probability that some student will drop out from a course their engagement with course material uh, or recommend them books, course, and so on, their well-being, their social connections. So for example, from mobility data, it has been shown that we can, we can track people down, like who are the people who are frequently getting together based on their uh, location data or Wi-Fi data, and then inferring the social ties among different groups of people and emotional, different emotional states. So some of them are just pseudoscience, like well-being is so vague and so abstract concept that it, there is no way they can be measured based on just how people click through different applications. And some of them are um, useful, but again, the question is then, do we actually need all this data or we can do with less data to, to lessen the, the uh, security or privacy risk of students? So we looked at causal machine learning uh, for this purpose. So give you, to give you an, uh, intuition, some intuition, so how machine learning models works is we feed 
these models with past historical data and then we use this model to predict future um, uh, to predict uh, about our future. So for example, if I feed a model to my location history and then I can ask, okay, wh where will I be at this time? So for example, if if you see me every Friday in at a market, you can, and next time someone asks where I'll be on the flight uh, on, on next Friday, you can with pretty high confidence, you can say that, yeah, that person will be in, in that market. So there is a pretty, high correlation of the day of the week between the day of the week and uh, my location at a particular time but the day of this day of the week may not be the reason for me being in this market so for example i could, uh, maybe the reason is that on fridays i get paid i get my paycheck which is why i go for shopping so the reason is not it's friday the reason is that i get paid on friday if i got pay in, in Tuesday, I would be in the market in Tuesday, not on Friday. So this is the causal reasoning, like what are the reason versus what is what other things are correlated with some observation. So the for, uh, whether it's a causal model or correlational model, we always, the machine learning is always about learning some function. So a function has an input and an output. And um, once we learn these functions, we can then use this function to predict future outcomes. So a very simple case is, you know, these uh, straight lines, right? A straight line is a function. So y equals to x plus b is a function. Y is a function of x. X and y both are variables. A and b are parameters of these functions. So once we learn a and b, then for any x, we can find y. So in other words, if, if we can learn some functions of uh, the correlations between my between uh, time and my location, then for in future, for any given time, I can find or I can predict my probable location. So, but again, this is correlation, not causation. So this function cannot tell whether the X was the reason for Y. So, so we use this kind of reasoning to understand whether demographic data, which are very privacy sensitive, like gender or political affiliation or religion, whether they are uh, actually useful or they have any causal relevance to uh, learning analytic models. And we found no causal effect of students' gender and age group on learning analytics or course performance. But we found that gender and uh, age group, they can be inferred with high accuracy from behavioral data. So for example, uh, their click through data with online portal, we can infer their gender and age. That means uh, whoever has access to this data, they can infer these attributes about people and then also then maybe do targeted advertisement or tracking or profiling people and so on. And then we come, we try to prevent this by combining adversarial sensory and constraint optimization to uh, to prevent this kind of inference attack. So uh, just very briefly, like we have these behavioral features of students. We have this neural network model with some hidden layers. We feed these features and then we try to predict performance of students. Uh, how it happens is like how machine learning models learns is they it predicts something and that it compares this prediction with ground truth, then it updates its parameters based on how wrong it was. And um, it, it, it does it for many times and then ultimately it learns these parameters good enough so that it can predict with high accuracy. So what we did was we built a model with, uh, that can predict performance, but then we also predicted the gender uh, using the same model. But we tried to update the parameters so that this model, these parameters over time forgets information about students' gender. So in other words, this mo at the end of the training, this model could predict performance, that, but it couldn't predict gender anymore. So we removed, censored this gender information from this uh, uh, feature set. And we also constrained, so if you know the constraint optimal, I think uh, if you took uh, discrete math or, 
I don't know, uh, I forgot the course, but uh, so constraint of dimension is you constrain the parameter space with some cost function. So in the plot, you can see the cost function that we applied. So uh, the end result was we identified some features, behavioral features that could be released and could be used to create um, uh, learning analytic model, but cannot be used to predict gender or age information of the students. So in summary, um, we showed that uh, these demographic information are not required to build in learning analytics and they shouldn't be collected. We can do with less data. Okay, so now future in the, along this line, we I have um, planned to do future research in the in the um, uh, internet measurement method, following the internet measurement methodology, like uh, understanding um, at a large scale, what are the security privacy issues perceived by different user groups like students, uh, parents, teachers, system administrators in uh, different uh, uh, educational institutes. And that means we need um, uh, skills like web scrapping, data mining, natural language processing. Another trait would be understanding different API able because this uh, for uh, large companies like uh, Google Classroom or Blackboard or Canvas, they have these third party APIs. And using this API, anyone can build applications, different applications that has access to the same data sets. So um, we want to understand if these applications are abusing this API or if there are like third party ad ecosystems that are using this data set for uh, unintended purposes, for example. And we need skills like system security, uh, data transmit, like uh, uh, tainting the uh, mobile, uh, mobile uh, devices, for example, to track what data they collect and how this data are being shared with different uh, third party APIs and vulnerability analysis of these applications. Uh, so if you are also into hacking stuff uh, and interested in, in this domain, uh, in this direction of research, uh, let me know. And then also user centric research, like uh, again, as I told you, like understanding how people perceive uh, the risk, how we can inform them about the true risk uh, without um, uh, and and um, uh, kind of train them to properly use different technologies and different interventions, understanding their psychological um, profiles or mental models. And so that would require a lot of skill from HCI or psychology. So again, if you are interested in any of these domains, any of these research directions, let me know. There is, if you no, uh, there is this Fury, uh, Fury uh, or Fulton Undergraduate Research Initiative. So you can get um, paid when you work uh, under some research program. So if you are interested, let me know. Uh, okay, so that, oh, sorry, I forgot the fourth um, shade of this research. So which is mostly ML based attacks and defenses. So for example, adversarial machine learning. So the one I showed you like adversarial censoring of, uh, of feature set, causal machine learning, federated, so federated machine learning is uh, very suitable in this context because what it does is um, it trains machine learning models uh, with data that resides in different institutes. So think about uh, Canvas. Canvas uh, provides their service to a lot of institutes and it trains its models using data from all these institutes. So federated learning is a paradigm that can train models without sharing this data across institutes. So it, uh, how it happens is it, it uh, trains a model locally or updates the model locally and send this update to a global service without uh, so that the global model can update its parameters, but it doesn't see the whole data sets. Uh, so this is a very promising uh, research paradigm in this domain. Um, so, okay. So here is the summary. I will keep this slide on so that you can look at and let me know what you think. So now uh, I think we have 15 minutes left, right? So yeah, 
uh, now I'll take questions, comments, suggestion, feedback, whatever. If you have anything, uh, raise your hand and talk to me. So you were asking if you have this uncensored image. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's a good question because there are these two different ways you can censor it. So if you use any cryptographic method, for example, and encrypt full, the full image or part of the image, then it's reversible. Um, if someone has the keys, the encrypted keys, they can just reverse the image and see the full original unaltered version. If you do pixel manipulation, like with computer models or generative models, then it's not fully recoverable. Like deep learning models can recover some alterations, like a blurred image or pixelated image. They can recover these images. But again, so the purpose is different social media context is uh, I see okay yeah so I guess uh, the purpose is different if you want um, to share an image to only specific people and you want absolute guarantee that no one else can recover the original image, then the cryptographic method are more suitable. But that is not probably very uh, applicable in the social media context where the purpose is I want to show this image, but I also want to prevent unintentional leaking of information, whether about myself or other people. And uh, in that case, the filtering method is more suitable Yes, so that's where the um, mobile application research area comes in. So we, we want to give these people this ability to quickly and automatically uh, offer, detect and offer set content, but they can also ha have the control, like if they don't like any specific offer creation or they think they don't want to actually hide some, some stuff, they can just unblur or share this image.
Uh, yeah, so I can read this question from Zoom actually. Thank you for this question. The question is, what led you to explore this research? It is so valuable, thank you. If there is time, attend. Okay, do you have any concerns about the Mozilla Facebook partnership? Um, okay, so the first question, why I did this research, it, it, it was actually very personal, yes, because I was very, I felt very annoyed when other people took my image, especially my friends, that I didn't want to share. So there is also this large um, area of research, like how people negotiate when there is a group ownership of images, for example. So then how, they, how do they negotiate ownership and sharing preferences? Because if there are multiple people in an image, um, they often do not have the same privacy concerns or same privacy preferences. So how do they, uh, collectively decide how this image should be shared. So uh, it was, for me, it was very personal. I felt like uh, this is an important area of research because uh, at personal level, we have this um, social or professional problem, but at a higher level, we have this collective issues of uh, mass surveillance, tracking, and so on. So that motivated me to to explore this uh, this uh, research area and then the partnership is yes, this is unfortunate and of course i in general i worry about like how much we are being controlled by this um this uh, corporations who donate for example to to uh to our research or who build this kind of partnerships with non uh, non-profit organizations or research uh, institutes and then dictate how we should do research so yeah this is concerning um, um a recent story i can tell you is so there is a very famous researcher who does research on this educational technology space uh, regarding students' privacy, ethics, surveillance, and so on. And there are two um, conference venues, uh, LAK and EDM, so Education, Data Mining, and Learning Analytics and Knowledge. And I, I don't remember which one, but one of them, so this person was invited for a keynote talk at one of these conferences, but he declined because Proctorio was one of the sponsors of this uh, conference. And Proctorio is the most invasive technology uh, according to this researcher and also many other people. And so, yeah, this is unfortunate, but uh, we need to, uh, we, we can just do our best to, to kind of maintain our own independence in, uh, in how we do research and what we focus on. Any other question? Yes. Yes, I think so. I mean, it is uh, regarded as a human right in many countries, uh, most of the European countries, and they, they have this in their constitution, like you cannot uh, collect people's data with their, con you uh, probably have heard about GDPR, which is, uh, which dictates like how different online pro platforms should be collect people's data and share them, how they should obtain their consents and so on. We have here in, in California, CCPA um, is somewhat similar. So if you go visit a website, when you are in California, you will see different notice uh, about your privacy choices than you are in any other state. Same if you are in an European country, you will see a lot more like um, warning signs or a lot more uh, options to choose from, like how you want or what data you want do not want to share or um, so, but that's not universally true in the US. Uh, but yeah, I do think uh, it should be uh, regarded as a hu fundamental human right. Because like how, so uh, again, these technologies learn about us and then we also turn into this technology towards these technologies to, for example, when you go to YouTube, when you go to Facebook or Goodreads, 
the algorithms decide what you should read, what news you should watch, what book, uh, what movie you should watch. Um, that means that they, they not only dictate um, what we should think, but also how we, how we should think, right? So that's uh, scary. And we don't know much about this, this recent development of this huge complex algorithm, like how do they work? There are a huge um, uh, area of research, like ethics of algorithm or fit, fairness of algorithm, because these algorithms decide many important fact, uh, issues in our life, like how, whether someone should be given a loan or not, whether someone should be allowed to go on a parole or not in the criminal justice system. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, so, I mean, these are as important as uh, our food or clothes or medical benefits that, that are our fundamental human rights. So privacy should be regarded as a fundamental human right. Question, comment? I think we are almost out of time. So again, if you have any question, comment, you are interested in research, shoot me an email. I think we should pack up, right? <laughs>